this is a very special session here because these three gentlemen are from band eight. Please don't all speak at the same time. All right. You, I was at the San Diego Naval Training Center, had the band there. Uh, I was a warrant officer, I think two there. And I had completed three years, and they wrote and said that uh, that I that I had my fun now, that I had to come back to school. So I packed everything up, come back to school m music, and they said, you're the academic training officer. Your office is down the hall to the right. And that, that was my first day at the school. I was very happy, though, to to learn though, that my that my close friends and associates from way back in band eight when we came to, to Navy together were there with me, Gene Huddleston and Dutch Albert. So, and what year was that that you came back to the school? Nineteen sixty. Nineteen sixty. Okay. Yes, he was already there. Um, I think he he was there there. I think he was there forever. He he took one the cruise to the Med and then 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 out and uh, on a battleship to uh, Japan and, and this type of thing. But uh, he spent most of his time at the school. Boy, that's a wrong opinion if I ever heard one. <coughs> uh, I took a six fleet band in September of 1950, and. Uh, in May of 1952, the chief of staff called me up and said, tomorrow we want to swear you in as a warrant officer, ship's clerk C4. And I asked him what that's about. And he says, well, you are the first music officer in the fleet uh, to be sworn in. He says, you are the first one. I says, well, how many at the music school are being sworn in? He says, I don't know. And at the time I was thinking, there's some great men back there, great musicians, great administrators who should be making warrant before I, because I'm really just a fleet staff bandmaster. And, uh, about 17 days later, the Admiral called me up and says, if you don't get sworn in, I'm going to send this back. And I said, well, he said, what's, a, what's holding you up? I said, well, I, there's, I'm waiting to hear how many of the instructors and the staff at the music school made warrant before I take it. I said, because I think they should have it before I do. He says, if you think that way, you'll never get it. He says, I want you up here tomorrow morning and be sworn in or I'm going to send it back. Next morning, I went up and was sworn in as Warren Officer Ship's Clerk C4. With, I think it was a 7852 designator. And I finished my cruise there in the 6th Fleet. Came back, took over the Bainbridge Naval Training Center band, which was a 72-piece band. And at that time, it had 36 graduates of the Juilliard School of Music reserve musicians. And none of them with any fleet training or basic training in boot camp or anything else. And they were nothing really but individual musicians, but they were good musicians. And it was uh, it was kind of a tough job, but uh, I stayed there until uh, October 1955, when I was transferred down to the school as a materiel officer, and uh, that encompassed taking care of all the equipment at the music school, all the uh, uh, fleet music an instrument dis uh, distribution center, uh, the purchase and inspecting of all the musical instruments for the fleet and for the school, 
and uh, also the music for uh, for that group. And uh, it was really a a tremendously busy job. At that time, we were getting thirty-three thousand dollars a year uh, to run the school, and uh, that wasn't nearly enough. And uh, McDonald, who was the officer in charge at the time, says, "How long will it take to replace all these junk instruments we have? Uh, Pencil, Mueller clarinets, the old pea shooter trumpets, and the." Um, uh, con double bell euphoniums and uh, uh, a real mix match. We even had some Carl Fisher clarinets uh, in, in the supply room up there. And uh, I said, well, let me inventory. So we inventoried and I said, well, on today's prices, we can probably do it in eight years. And we made a good show. We uh, we ended up when the school moved down to Little Creek. Uh, we had Selmer clarinets, uh, both the uh, thermoplastic and the uh, Selmer specials, which were good clarinets. Uh, we had uh, uh, mostly six and eight D French horns, and instead of uh, uh, lesser oboes, we had uh, uh, who. Forget the name of the oboe now. A uh, French oboe, anyhow. Uh, we had Besson euphoniums, and we had Bach trumpets, and we had the uh, Con Constellation trumpets, and we had uh, the some of the Holt and Farkas model of French horns too. But we had a good bunch of instruments. Uh, an interesting thing happened one year, though. The bureau called the officer in charge of the school and said how short they were of money, and uh, he wanted the officer in charge to give some money back that we weren't going to need. And w without consulting, this was another officer in charge uh, who relieved McDonald. And without asking me what the schedule was or anything else, he gave $30,000 of the $33,000 back to the Bureau. So I had $3,000 to buy all the accessories and everything for the School of Music. In the meantime, I was chairman of the Joint Services uh, Quality Standards Committee for Musical Instruments. And we were writing specifications for musical instruments. And uh, eventually the Bureau said, we don't need such good instruments. We're going to stop the specification program. And we're just going to buy off the shelf. Well, that's where we just came from eight years before that. And uh, consequently, that was about the same time that they start talking about <coughs> moving the school music. And uh, we stopped the specification programs and we're not, but I was still able to, to convince the supply office of the, the, basically that the specification still existed. And until someone stopped the specifications and canceled them, while well, they were still in effect, but we weren't making any new ones. And uh, basically that was it, and that was my job until the day I retired. Okay, now let me ask you a question. You went to the school in 55, and <clears throat> you headed the material office, material department. And what was going on there before you got there? Do you know? Who had it? Um, like they had a chief that was in charge of supply. Okay. And uh, Bowers had actually started the specification program. Uh, it was Chief Bowers had actually started the specification program, and... Uh, it was a work in progress when I got there. I didn't start it. So it, it was just a work in progress that, that I was continuing and building. And uh, I think we did a, a tremendous job uh, on the instruments that we got in those eight years before the school moved down to uh, Little Creek. And then I retired in the 1st of June of 1964.
Okay, now, well, let's uh, back up a little bit and catch up a couple of other people. Now, uh, Eamon came in 62, did you say? 60. 60. Now, uh. you you were already there, right, uh, Gene? Yes, in yes. 60. He, well, right. I, uh, he was, no, I wasn't there. Okay, pass, wasn't pass the mic. There when. Uh, I was called back in in 51. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, it was interesting. They busted me from first class to third because I re-enlisted in order to get to come back to the school and go on the arranging staff. I walked around the school with two ash marks and a third class crow and all the kids thought I was some drunk that had been busted several times and would probably be busted again. But then when they put me on the staff, I automatically made second class. They let you go up to regain my original first class rate once. So I got that back. Later on, a couple of years, I made chief. And I was chief for 13 days. They told me not to sew the crow on very tight, just loosely. Then I was appointed to warrant officer in uh, 57, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. Is that right? right. That's right. Okay, now when you said you were called back in in 51, that you were, he had broken service and that was the beginning of the Korean War? Is that, that what yes, was uh, going on? Yeah, there? I was called back for the Korean War. Right. Yeah. And uh, I had the option of going to sea from San Francisco for two years as a reserve and then being dumped back ashore after two years, which I didn't want to do because it's very difficult to leave a, an area where you're working, your name disappears, they think you're dead, and then come back and say you've been rejuvenated and you need to work again. So after a lot of talking, after a lot of talking with my wife over several cups of coffee, I told her that I'd, I'd been playing with some good bands the outside, and I was teaching at a conservatory, and I was writing. But at no time did any of the bands I was working with tell me about their retirement plan. So I says, if I go back in, I've got eight years now, so I'll just stay and, and do the whole thing. So I did that. So you were appointed warrant in 57? 57. 57. And I, I missed you because I never knew you as first class, you see, or chief, although I can't, I'd come back in 50. Well, there was only about three people knew I was chief. I was in yeah. and out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, and you were, after you were appointed, you were assigned to the band training department, right? No, they yeah. they they sent me to uh, San Francisco Treasure Island. Oh, okay. It was kind of a north knife and fork school kind of a thing. Uh, somebody says he does conduct, doesn't he? And everybody looked at everybody and says, "I don't know." And so they asked me, and I says, "No, I don't conduct." They said, "Well." You must start doing that. So they started me on the national anthem. I'm in the auditorium rehearsing how to start the national anthem, which is kind of a bear. And Sam Andalone walked through the thing. And he says, hey, Gene, he says, you don't have to go through all that. He told the man, he says, play. And he turned his back on him, lifted his right foot up and swung it in a little circle, and they all played. <laughs> it was kind of funny, but that's, that's the way I learned to conduct an national anthem.